morning. I'm Ben Ayers, Dean of the Terry College of Business. It's my pleasure to welcome you to our Terry Third Thursday series. This is a monthly breakfast event that we uh, host here at our Exec Ed Center. Uh, this is the home of our Exec Ed, as well as our Professional MBA Program and uh, Executive MBA Program. And I'll start with just updates this week. Financial Times on Sunday released their international rankings. Uh, of executive MBA programs, and this year we came in with a number 11 ranking in the U.S., at number three public U.S., top in the state of Georgia, and obviously top in the state, uh, in the city of Atlanta. So we're very thrilled for our executive MBA and what that represents for our alumni. Uh, one piece of there, we uh, in the U.S. ranked number one in pr uh, career progression, and so uh, you get your EMBA or PMBA for impact on your career, and we're thrilled for that. Uh, let me thank our alumni board for organizing today's event and this series. They do a great job uh, each year with this, and let me thank them. Also, our corporate sponsors. So, Synovus has been a consistent sponsor for us for many years, so please join me in thanking them. And then our media sponsors, Atlanta Business Chronicle, as well as WABE, Atlanta Public Broadcasting. So please let me thank them as well. <laughs> Upcoming Terry uh, Third Thursday program. So next month we'll have Chris Womack, who's the chairman and CEO of Georgia Power. So this fall, we're glad to be back from the pandemic and we've started off really strong. So today obviously with Josh and, and uh, next month with Chris and last month with the governor. Uh, also, upcoming economic, uh, ec upcoming college events. So in December, we'll have the Atlanta Economic Outlook Forecast. That will take place at the Georgia Aquarium. That'll be on December 13th. Mark Bittner, who's the Managing Director and Senior Economist for Wells Fargo, he will provide the national forecast for 2022, and then I will provide the state economic forecast. Registration will open in November. You can go to terry.uga.edu forward slash EO and register for that. So that's always a great event for us. It's one of our largest public service and outreach events. I do anticipate uh, providing good news for the economy for 2022. So I hope uh, each of you will join us um, in December. And then uh, in January and February, I will travel across the state providing state forecasts and as well as local forecasts. Speaking of the Georgia Aquarium, I'd like to welcome the Georgia Aquarium executive team. They're with us today. They're here this week doing a leadership program uh, for their executives, and we're thrilled that they chose the Terry College and our executive programs for their investment in their, their staff. Um, we do appreciate you choosing the Terry College of Business. So without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce today's speaker who needs no introduction but I will give him an introduction. Uh, UGA's Director of Athletics, Josh Brooks. After serving 11 years at UGA, most recently as Interim Director of Athletics and Senior Deputy Director of Athletics, Josh was named the J. Reed Parker Director of Athletics for the University of Georgia in January of 2021. He worked closely with former Director of Athletics, Greg McGarity, overseeing athletic operations, and served as the liaison with UJ's architect's office with all the construction that you've seen uh, of athletic facilities in recent years. Josh first worked for UJ's athletic association between 2008 and 2014, serving as director of football operations and then associate athletic director for internal operations. He then went back to his native Louisiana in 2008 to serve as deputy athletics directors for the University of Louisiana Monroe and then Director of Athletics for Millsaps College, and then returned back to his adopted home of Athens in 2016. Over his years working in college and university athletics, uh, Josh has been committed to bridging the gap between the campus and the local communities. In January of this year, he pledged 100,000 to create a new need-based scholarship that will support UGA students from athens Clark County, and we're very appreciative of that support for our local communities. Josh is a native of Hammond, Louisiana, graduated from some school in LS, LSU, <laughs> okay? <laughs> Look, in my bio, it says that I graduated um, from another school in the SEC, so yeah, you've... <laughs> you got two degrees. Well, 
So with a degree in kinesiology and has completed his master's degree in sports management at UGA, Josh and his lovely wife, Lily, they have three boys that keep them busy outside of work. And so Josh, welcome. Please join me in welcoming Josh Brooks. Well, first, let me just address the elephant in the room. I am not a Ted Cruz impersonator, so I know you're, you're thinking it, so just go ahead and get it out of your system right now. If, I know that was going to be a question later on. <laughs> I'll tell you a funny story. I was at a basketball game a few years ago, and there was this gentleman sitting next to me, and he had jet black hair. He had the tight roll jeans. He looked like an Elvis impersonator. And he kept giving me the eye the whole time. And I know he was like, I'm like, why is this guy looking at me? And he walks up to me during a break and goes, hey, I just want to let you know I'm a professional imitator, and you could make a great living as a Ted Cruz impersonator. Like, <laughs> so... If they ever fire me, I've got a good backup plan um, for my next step. Um, I wanted to share with you today uh, some things that are important to me and as it relates to business and, and, and what y'all do and um, as we think differently in athletics and how we operate. And we have termed this indirect return on investment. Some people call it soft ROI or whatever you have, but for us it's indirect ROI. A lot of times in, in what we do and what we all do, we focus only on ROI, what is right in front of us, what we can linear, you know, see if we do X, we get Y. If we, if we change this price of tickets, we'll sell this many if we do that. And, I, and, and that's important. We all have KPIs and metrics and measurables and things that we need to stick to. But for me, a lot of what we do, if we think long term, we've got to think beyond what's quantitative and think qualitative and think indirectly how it could benefit us into the future. So it's something that I challenge my staff. It's something we always want to think about. And I want to touch on some of those things today and some of the organizations and companies that have inspired me throughout my journey. So first, let's start off with our vision. Today, I'm going to share with you our vision, our mission, and our core values. So I'll give you a minute to read this vision statement. And this is a vision statement that we worked very hard. My exec team worked, put a lot of time into what exactly our vision is. But the thing I want to focus on with you today is the last part, enhancing the student athlete experience and preparing them for life beyond UGA. When you think about it, the first core things that we, that we want to focus on our vision, we want student athletes to do well in school. We want them to graduate. We want them to have success on the field, be all conference, be all American. We want to championships. Those are the measurables. Those are the KPIs right in front of us that we want to accomplish right now. But ultimately, our long-term goal is beyond that. We want to think about our student athletes when they're in their 30s and 40s and 50s. One of my proudest moments is something that actually happened recently is being able to hire Brandon Boykin in our development office. Brandon was a, I can't say young man anymore, but when he came in, we came in together in Georgia in 2008. Phenomenal student, phenomenal student athlete, and to see him grow and what that program, what the University of Georgia meant to him, now he's ready for whatever he takes on in the world. That's the ultimate goal for us, and that will lead to so many greater benefits, again, that we can't measure. Um, so we've got to believe in those indirect things that aren't right in front of us. So we know that, hey, if we train Brandon hard and we take care of him, he's gonna become an All-American, he's gonna get drafted, he's gonna do well, he's gonna make money in the NFL. That's great, but we're really more concerned about the long-term effect. And I think when we focus on that, you'll see greater impact through that. One of my great uh, you know, people that's inspired me in my life is Walt Disney. And no one can ever doubt that Disney World and between movies and TV and parks and cruises and everything else, that Disney makes money. No question about it, right? But that, I, I have to believe that was never Walt Disney's why. His why was to create a joyful experience, to create a park or an experience to where someone could escape from their reality and have a, a great day, to bring out the inner child in an adult. And it, you know, the quote of, it, it's, it's the work of love. He didn't go into the idea with just making money. And I think that's for all of us. You know, I, I don't know one administrator or one coach in athletics that said, you know what, I got athletics just to make money. There's no way. We, could, we work way too many, and a lot of you, for your businesses, what you do, you work way too many hours to be just result-oriented on making money. It's a work of love, and I can tell you that, don't tell my boss this, but I would do this job for a lot less money. I mean, I would do this almost, for, <laughs> I love this job. It's the greatest, you know, it's one of the greatest jobs on the planet, right? So I do it for, for the joy and, and the purpose. The money, the results for me or for our business is just, it's just a result, that's all it is, because at the end of the day, our mission in athletics is nowhere in it will they ever say to generate revenue. That's just a byproduct of what we do. Now it's a necessity to keep our lights on and keep everything rolling, but it's not the purpose. So when you think about Disney, one of the, the, my favorite stories um, 
I became friends with one of the individuals at Disney who runs the Disney Institute, and we're looking at actually doing some Disney Institute training here um, with our staff in the coming months, is the fireworks story. I'm not sure if any of you know the story, but there was a time that Disney World did not, at Magic Kingdom, did not shoot fireworks every night. They estimate it's around forty to $50,000 a night to shoot fireworks. So there was someone in the organization that said, you know what, it's just too expensive to shoot fireworks every night. Now, what's the first thing you see when you put on a Disney movie? Cinderella's Castle and the fireworks. So you can imagine a Tuesday night, a little kid, a little boy or girl from middle of America making their first trip to Disney World. And their parents, they, this is the day they chose to go to Magic Kingdom. And then they find out there's no fireworks tonight. Now, quantitatively, and there's a KPI that they can tell you that if they keep the park open an extra hour and shoot fireworks, they're going to sell more concessions, they're going to sell more merch. That is a directly transactional way to look at it. But beyond that, the, that's not the reason they did it. The reason they did it is because they've got to imagine that little boy or girl from Nebraska, Missouri, wherever, that made their first trip to Magic Kingdom will have such a great experience capping off that day where they stood in lines, they sweated, they maybe had a, a break... <laughs> You know, all the kids at Disney World have all experienced it, a, a breakdown at some point. But you finish it with the fireworks, and that caps off that experience. It creates a memory and, and creates an experience that's hard to replicate. So two years from now, three years from now, when that family is deciding where to go on vacation, that little girl, little boy says, I want to go back to Disney World. Or think even long term, when that individual is a parent, and they've got their first child that's three or four or five, and they're ready for their first trip, they're going, we're going to Disney. So... Somewhere in the organization, there was someone saying, you know, it just doesn't make sense. Do we, are we really selling enough concessions? Are we really selling enough merch in that hour to, to pay for that forty to $50,000 worth of fireworks? But believing in the things you can't see right in front of you and knowing that it's going to lead to a better experience is what it's all about. So how does that relate to Georgia? The red lights, okay? It's a very simple connection, but if you, if you really think about it, uh, three or four years ago, we made the decision to switch out our old halogen lights to LED and had nothing to do with color lights, but it was just about efficiency and about operating better. And the company came to us and said, for you know an extra amount, we can make the lights change colors. And yes, we did do this before Alabama. I can promise you this was not a, no offense to them, but we were well, well I can document the planning that went ahead in this. But so we asked ourselves the question, is it worth it? And, and when you have to go to your boss at the time, I had to go to Greg McGarity and say, Greg, you know, for X amount more, we can make the lights change colors. And he goes, you know, it, it, at first it's kind of like change colors, and you haven't really thought about what it could be. And then when you dig down and go, man, we could really make this tradition of the fourth quarter, light the fourth quarter, we could take it to a whole nother level. Now, at the same time, you want to be balanced. You don't want to go too crazy because Georgia, we're very tradition-based. So how can we take this tradition of the fourth quarter and kick it up a notch? So I'll tell you a funny story. You know, when you script up how you want to debut something like this, I don't think it could have gone any better for us, the first night game being the Notre Dame game. And what a, if you remember that point of the game, it was kind of a momentum change. I think we just had a turnover, got the ball, we're down, driving, and then the fourth quarter hits. And what y'all don't know is we've been practicing this whole light shut off thing for weeks. And the week of the game, someone told me, they said, hey, we're having a little trouble with the pro we have to rewrite the programming for the lights. I said, what do you mean? He goes, the coding's too long and it could the lights could go out. Or they could not come or it could not work. I was like, what do you when you say not work, what do you mean? <laughs> he goes, Well they'll work, but they won't all the effects will be gone. But it'll just be all on, all white. I said, Okay, that, that's the worst thing. Okay. But we knew in the fan no one knew that we were gonna drop the lights all black for one second just to create that big dramatic pause before they went all red. So I knew when it was coming, and I was sitting right there watching it. And I'm going to tell you the longest second of my life. <laughs> it felt like 15 seconds to me. And when the lights came back on and went all red, I, it, was, it was a phenomenal moment for me. But, but you create experience that night. And I can tell you anyone was there that can tell you their memory of that night of that game. So again, just like that little boy or little girl at Disney World, you have no idea that whoever could have been in attendance because it's not just season ticket holders. It's someone who bought their first ticket off the secondary market, and that could have been their one game a year, or it could have been their first time in Sanford. Again, they may beg their parents to take them to future games. They may want to be a Terry student one day. They may want to be a college athlete. You can't even measure the, the impact experiences like this will have down the road. So this was never a decision about transactionally. 
if we do the lights, what will it lead? Will we sell more tickets in that same year? Will we sell more concessions? How will it generate more revenue for us? We didn't never ask that question. It was let's enhance the experience. One of my other favorite things about Disney is the customer relations service, the way that they take care of you. They have individuals in the park whose only job is to seek out individuals who may be lost, who may have questions, who may just look like they have an issue. Um, I was at Disney many years ago when my twins were very young. It was day four. You all know day four in the park, right? When the kids are, you're pushing them, come on, let's get, we got to get this right in, get this right in, get this right in, and you're pushing, trying to get through. And one of my twins went in full meltdown mode because I believe the show we were trying to go to cut off, we couldn't get in, and it, he is unconsolable, he is crying, and, and it is, you know, it's embarrassing as a parent, you don't know what to do. A guest service person walks over, helps us calm him down, gives us four fast passes to the ride of our choice. Hey, buddy, what do you want to ride? We can go ride it right now, no line, let's go. They took that negative experience and flipped it on, flipped it upside down, and that's what I challenge our staff to do. Now, I've told that story, not just to you, but I've told that story probably 100 times, where that story could have been, man, you know, don't go to Disney because, you know, by day four, your kids are going to be melting down and it's going to be a terrible experience. They flip the script and, and change it into a positive. And that's one of the things I love that they do. So how do we do that at Georgia? We started a program called the Silver Dogs. And to be honest, we stole a little bit of this from Notre Dame. When we went to Notre Dame, um, and they had individuals like this. And again, they're, the Silver Dogs, only, they're a volunteer group, and their only mission is to help and serve and find people who need help. Hey, do you need to know what gate to enter? Do you need to know where your seats are? Do you need to, do you have a question about clear bag, whatever it may be. My favorite story, and when you implement something like this, you're wondering how's it gonna go? Is it gonna get well received? Is it gonna hit the impact we want? But there were never any KPIs for Silver Dogs. There were never any, we have to do X, Y, and Z to make it worth our time. Because even though they're a volunteer group, we spend money on their uniforms, we feed them, we do, so it is a cost to us but again, it was never about what are we gonna, what is the director current on doing this? My favorite story was actually from our first G-Day we implemented them was, um, on G-Day we use our Tate Center as handicap parking. We had a gentleman come up to the stadium in an electronic wheelchair. He pulls up the stadium and then he's immediately in, in panic mode because he left his charger and his battery's running low, he left his charger in his car. Silver Dog approaches him, says, sir, can I help you? He goes, yes, I need help. My battery's running low. I forgot to bring my charger. I need to go plug it in where I was going to go sit as a charger. I need someone to help get to, get to my car and get my charger. This silver dog gets their keys, goes there, find their car, gets a charger, helps them, plugs them in. Now, I've never met that gentleman. It's a, it's a story that was told to me by silver dogs, but I can promise you that gentleman feels like the University of Georgia cares about him, and he's probably told that story to 100 people. Again, that story could have been a negative story. Man, I got to Georgia. They had nothing, to, no one there to help me and I was stuck and I had to you know, call someone to come pick me up. Those are the kind of experiences how you flip the script and taking a potentially negative experience and flip it into something positive. Again, I can't quantify or tell you any KPIs of what, we have no KPIs for that group, but we believe in what they're doing is leading to a better outcome and a better experience for all, for all our fans. So our mission, I'll give you a second to read this. And as we talk about our vision, mission, and, and I'll get to our core values later, this is, these are things we put a lot of time into. And in and, and all honesty, these are not groundbreaking. These are very comparable to most of our peers throughout the country. But the part of this I really want to focus on is the last part. We are committing to providing a first-class experience for all stakeholders and making a lasting impact on our community. And when you really think about that, it's not just the high-end donors. It's everyone. You know, people focus on football a lot, but we have a lot of free events. And we have people in, the, in our surrounding areas who can't afford to go to football games, who can't afford to go to football, uh, basketball games, but we have free events. And it, how do we treat those people? And we know that scientifically there's a fact that proves that any time a child steps foot on a college campus, their odds of attending college dramatically go up. So what can we do in our community in athens Clark County to get kids from our community to step foot on our campus, whether it's a women's basketball game, whether it's a softball game, whether it's a baseball game at and treat them the right way to where they feel welcome and that we're making an impact in our community. One of my heroes is Esther and Kathy, and, and I love this quote, I've always found more joy in giving when I'm not expecting anything in return. And when you think about Chick-fil-A and all the little things that they do, they do so many things that transactionally, or just from an ROI perspective, 
don't add up, or I guarantee you that they're not focused on that. One of the first things I love about them is the way they decorate their stores, the way they clean their stores. This is a mural of, of one of the Chick-fil-A's in Athens. You know, who knows what that cost? They could have just had regular wallpaper, but small details like that that make people feel good or make them feel have a connection when they walk in there. And then another shot of, this is always a small detail I love, the fresh flowers. They could easily not have, I mean, how many fast food places have fresh flowers at the, at the table? Small details like this that go a long way. The money and time they put into cleaning the venue to make it look immaculate and, and, and make you feel good when you walk in there. So how does that correlate with us? We have spent a, a large amount of money recently on updating graphics uh, throughout all our facilities. Here's one example of uh, the West End Zone. Here's another example of our Sky Club of enhancing those things. Be, but beyond graphics, it's how we clean. We now have a custodian assigned to every single restroom in Sanford Stadium. Now, it's a challenge, obviously, when you have 90,000 people in the stadium to keep up with it, but we have an individual whose only job on game day is to keep that restroom as clean as possible. Now, that's a cost, and I can't, again, I can't tell you the return on that investment. And no one's come into the game because of a clean restroom or because of a graphic, but I have to believe in that. And when you think about graphics, one of the things we, we get a lot of times from coaches is they always want to update their graphics. They want it, that wow factor when a recruit steps on campus. Sometimes an administrator will fire back at a coach and say, do you really think that kid's going to commit to Georgia just because of a graphic? Well, my answer to that is this. When I was wooing my wife, it wasn't the chocolates. It wasn't the flowers. It wasn't me holding the door. It wasn't me being polite. That's not why she fell in love with me. But when you're courting someone, you leave no stone unturned. So if the same thing, whether it's a customer or a potential recruit, we can't leave any stone unturned, whether the facility's clean, new graphics, whatever it may be. So I don't buy into the, well, if we do that, is it going to get us a direct, is the recruit going to commit? Because I don't believe in that. I believe in the bigger picture of that and, and creating the entire picture. And maybe my wife did fall in love with me for the, it wasn't for the Ted Cruz looks. I can promise you that. So <laughs> it was, it was, maybe it was the flowers. I don't know. Um, the sauce packets. This is a silly one, but it's a big one. When you go to Chick-fil-A and you place your order and you, they ask you what kind of sauce you want, they always make you feel like it's never a burden to them to give you more. How many places have we went to where we've said, can I get a packet of ketchup? And they give you one, and then you have to ask for two, and you feel like a jerk for asking for that second packet. Now, I, I don't know. And I've asked, but I didn't ask too hard. But I'm, but I'm sure there's an accountant somewhere at Chick-fil-A going, man, you know, if we just, if we tightened up on the, the sauce packets, you know, we're burning an extra, who knows, per store. It could be $100,000 a year on sauce packets that we're giving out. If we just charge 30 cents for the extra packets, think about the money we'd make. But think about the experience. And we all, and I'm sure you've heard of it, and people joke about it all the time. They've been memes about it, about the way Chick-fil-A treats you with the sauce. It's a little thing, but it's a big thing. Because in the, in the stressful life of post-practice, child's practice, and you're trying to get through the drive through as fast as possible, you don't want to have to deal with another issue. Just, just give me, the, just please give me another Chick-fil-A sauce packet. That's all I want. But you don't have to, you know you're going to get taken care of. So the correlated factor of that for, at, for us at Georgia is how we've changed our concessions operations and how, what we've done with water, okay? So we have anywhere from 10 to 12 water refill stations in our stadium. We've also created a rule where you can bring in one unopened bottle of water anytime you enter Sanford Stadium or any of our venues. Now, I can quantifiably tell you how it's impacted our, uh, our sales. I can tell you on a chart and say, before we, before we did these things, we sold X, now we sell Y, we sell less. But our first priority at any venue is safety. And when it's 92 degrees outside or more at Sanford Stadium, you don't want water, one of life's basic necessities, to be an issue, okay? It's the right thing to do, okay? It's the right thing to do for, even if there wasn't a return, it's the right thing to do. Now, indirectly, you can believe that with these water refill stations and the water bottles, the more people I keep out of a concession line that just want water, maybe that's the line will move quicker, maybe more people will want to get in the line, maybe that's the people that will buy the Zaxby sandwich, the Chick-fil-A sandwich, the Papa John's pizza, buy the bigger ticket items. So maybe indirectly they, they will lead to it, or maybe they'll just feel good and say, you know what, I didn't pay for water, I brought my own water in, I got a free water refill, I feel more 
engage that I'm going to purchase more at the concession stand. So hard to measure, but you got to believe that there is some indirect ROI on that. But at the end of the day, we didn't do it for any of that. We did it because of the right thing to do. One of my favorite things of, and I'm not a golfer by any means, but my favorite thing of going to Augusta National is eating as much as I can for 20 bucks. And, you know, it's, it's always a challenge. What can I get for 20 bucks and how much can I, you know, eat? And we have mimicked Augusta National, what, um, what the Falcons have done and what others have done, the Hawks have done it to some degree, and create a family-friendly pricing menu. And this is a little contrary to, because sometimes you want to talk about value and not so much cutting prices, but the value you provide. But we're not, a, we're not solely a food business. We're an entertainment business, and food is just part of it. If you really think about concessions, it's really only about 1% of our operating revenue every year. So for any business, if I were to tell you, I'm going to take an item that's 1% of your revenue, I'm going to cut it dramatically, but your customer satisfaction is going to shoot up. I think most would do that. So for me, our concessions in reality is the condiment packets of George Athletics in all reality. So I have no problem lowering prices. So we came up with a family-friendly menu, hot dogs, 250, bottled water, 250, bottled soda, 250, candy, two bucks, popcorn, two bucks. The goal with that was, again, beyond football, any sporting event, if I've got a family of four, I want to be able to feed them for, four, for, under, for 20 bucks or less. Because even at football, it could be a customer of yours who's using those tickets for the Charleston Southern game. This is their first experience at San Francisco. They didn't pay for the tickets. It's maybe the family doesn't have a lot of money. And the kid says, Mom, Dad, let's go to the concession stand. And the parents go, wow, 40 bucks. I'm, I'm out 40, 45 bucks feeding four kids. You know, we all see it at the movies, right? Now that parent's upset. You've created a negative experience for that parent. That parent may turn down free tickets next time because they, or when they come, they're going to say, hey, eat before the game. We're not eating at the game. Is that the experience we want to create when that is only 1% of our revenue? Think about that. Also think about, again, I talk about the events that are free or the low-cost events. We have a lot of free athletic events. And if we're truly about getting the community out to softball games and soccer games and volleyball matches, do we want to say, hey, come in. Everything's free to come in. But when you come to the session stand, we're going to get you. You know, that's not, that's not what we want either, especially if we're talking about getting the community involved out to our athletic events. So it was important for me, and this is something we're going to keep evaluating, and hopefully we can get to a more complete menu overhaul in time because, again, the concessions is, is again, 1% roughly of our, our revenue, and it's just not that important to me. Um, and I respect our partners and what we have to do from that standpoint, but for me it's more about providing a service to our fans because, look, for football and basketball, our fans have already donated a fair amount and they've bought those tickets. I don't need to, we don't need a third tier of getting in their pocket. So our core values, again, I'll give you a minute to read, but three key terms for me, innovation, inclusion, and integrity, okay? So innovation, we've talked about it a little bit, the lights, we want to be on the cutting edge of doing new things. With that, we still want to respect tradition, everything we do. George has been here before us. Georgia will be here after us. So we're, we're not going to just take things off the rails and, and do things that don't fit in what we do. But we want to be innovative. We want to be inclusive. We mentioned that. We want to be a spot for our community, a spot where everyone can gather and all are welcome to come to our athletic events and feel, feel welcome and feel at home. And then integrity. We talked about doing things the, the water. Take all the measurables out of it, doing things the right way for the right reasons. And those are our three core things, the three eyes that we focus on in everything we do. And I think if we stay committed to that, we'll put out a great product. Okay, so this is one of my favorite pictures, and you're going to have to look closely at this one. Um, I don't know if this works. I can see. This never, uh, the laser never, uh, here we go. If you look real closely right there, you see a tennis ball. These, this is uh, Augusta National. So any, uh, some you, you've been, you've noticed, you've noticed how they cut the gra the fairways at Augusta National, where they've got several mowers and they're staggered throughout, right? Have you ever noticed the tennis ball hanging out on top of the? Uh, there's a tennis ball hanging in the front of every mower. Does anybody know what the the ball is there for? The ball is there for. So as you're cutting grass, if you're the whoever you're the furthest back, you're looking at the mower in front of you. So you, part of your job as you're cutting is if you ever see the mower in front of you, the blades are off cutting improperly or they're, let's say, leaking hydraulic fluid, 
you're supposed to grab that tennis ball, throw it out in front, and then if anyone sees the tennis ball bouncing, everyone stops, shuts off their mower, and checks to make sure that there's nothing cutting wrong, nothing leaking, things like that. Attention to detail. And I always say, if it looks stupid but works, it's not stupid. And I believe in that. But this is attention to detail. The little things they do at Augusta National that cost more money. To, it, it, I'm sure it costs more money to have X amount of mowers and do it the way they do it. But they do it because they, they care about the results and they want it to be pristine and perfect. There's a reason they have green napkins. You know, in case a napkin were to fly on the course and TV picks it up, it would blend right in with the grass. It's those small attention to details that, again, if you're a business, you could say, let's cut corners, let's do a little cheaper, that's not efficient, but believing in the better experience and providing that first class, and, and we all know that no one does it better than Augusta National at pretty much everything they do. Going back to Chick-fil-A, the way they treat you, talking about being inclusive and welcoming. Um, I, my boys are now, my twins are 12, and my, my youngest is nine. There was a period of time where, you know, when my twins were, you know, four or five, and my little one was two or three, and that time, and you'd walk in, you, you know the struggle of three children at that age trying to feed them. At the, you're at the counter trying to order. What do you want? Do you want to, you know, you've got to tell, make up your mind, you know? There was a point in time where I noticed, and maybe we just looked this disheveled, but I'd walk into a Chick-fil-A, and the first thing they would say to me is, sir, you have a seat at the booth. We'll take your order from your table. When I experienced that, especially when we're traveling, whatever, nine times out of ten, I'm going to Chick-fil-A for that experience, to, to, to make my life a little better, to make my experience better. And you know what's funny about Chick-fil-A? I can't tell you what thing, one thing on the menu. I can't tell you the price of anything on the menu. There's no dollar menu. There's no value. I mean, it is what it is. And I, I wouldn't argue and just say, hey, just please just take my order and go, and, and I'm happy because of the level of service and care. Now, hiring an extra additional workers whose only job is to walk around and see if someone needs their order taken at their table, walking around and coming to you and saying, sir, can I refill that drink for you? Instead of making me have to go up to, because I, I'm trying to keep three kids just from you know not fighting each other. And of course, I'd love a refill, but it's not worth me leaving them three on a, you know, I, it, I'm, I'm triage, right? I'm just trying to keep them under control. But for them to come to my table and refill my drink, I can't put a price on that. And when I talk about concession prices at Georgia, remember, concessions is not what we do. That's a small part. Obviously, this is a big part of what they do. But instead of cutting costs, they're, they're focused on providing value in the experience. So it's something that always uh, stands out to me. The other thing about Chick-fil-A and many other companies is, is how they treat their employees. The scholarships they give their student athletes, the mentoring they do, just, just the way they train them, the way they treat them, they feel valued. We've tried to really, in my nine months in, in this role, I've tried to focus on what can we do to improve our staff morale. And we're gonna do things, again, that I cannot tell you an ROI on or anything direct. There's no KPIs on if we do this, they're gonna sell more. If I treat Brandon Boykin and Brad Bell better, they're gonna go raise more money. Hopefully they do, but, <laughs> but, but there's not a KPI on that that I do things. But we've implemented things and we have to adjust post-pandemic. And as we're dealing with millennials who, who approach the workplace differently, we have to think differently. One of the things we've done, flexible work hours. We've been very smart about that and saying, look, if Brad and, and Brandon are assigned to work the basketball game and they work till 10 o'clock on a Wednesday night, I don't need you in at 8 a.m. the next morning. Come in at 9 or 10. Go run the errand you need to run because you've been committed. You've worked from 5 p.m. to 10 p.m. that night. So being flexible. They're going to get their work in. Trust me, there's no one in athletics that's not getting a plus 40-hour work week in. But being flexible, being smart, and that's something that people appreciate oftentimes more than raises. Gene Fridays. This was something, this was a trick I had real quick. So I was named interim AD January 1st of this year. And I immediately, the first thing I did was start a Gene Fridays because I figured this. If I didn't get the job, the new person would have to cancel it or keep it. And I've at least made one change that either... <laughs> I've made a good change, or if that new person cancels it, everybody goes, well, man, when Josh was around, we had Gene Friday. So, <laughs> so we got that going immediately, and that's been, that's been a big hit. And, and you'd be surprised what, uh, how many times people have thanked me or something. It's, I don't get many thanks on raises. I really don't. That's, maybe they're thanking other people, but, I don't, but I've had more thank yous on Gene Fridays than anything else we've done. Another program we started is called Dying with the Dogs. We obviously have a lot of trade with a lot of our corporate partners for gift, gift certificates to places. So once a week, we'll draw a name from all our employees 
and we'll award them. They can pick uh, a $50 gift certificate to take their family out to dinner. You know, it's those little things. We've done food truck Fridays. Um, I'm real big into, you know, as we move out of the pandemic, wanting to have holiday parties, things like that, to just increase morale. And I had this debate the other day with my CFO, and it was the debate of what does the party cost, you know, and, and what in the thing of the cost of that party, but what we could do with it with other mission critical items. And I go, I understand that, but morale to me is mission critical. You know, I've got 300 employees who are working very hard. And I know when you look at it on a spreadsheet, you go, is that worth spending that money to do that? But I believe in the long term effects of that. So, um, and then lastly, to tie it all together, the question I get all the time is, what are you doing in this day and age with people in their, you know, their, in their basement with the 70 inch TV, their uh, fridge full of beer, their food they cooked at home, no traffic, no parking, no line at the restroom, no line of concessions, this big comfortable couch. What are you doing to offset that? And of course, we've talked about all the little things we want to do, lowering concession prices and how we treat people, sort of. But ultimately, this is the picture that means it all. You'll never get this experience at home. So we've got to keep programming and finding ways to create these experiences. Because I guarantee you, every student in that student section will remember their four years of lighting up Sanford Stadium in the fourth quarter. We've seen it. How many times have you seen it now where we are blowing out an opponent in the third quarter, and it's a night game, and no one's left? They're all waiting for that fourth quarter experience. And as soon as we do the lights, mass exodus, right? <laughs> And I'm okay with that because let's get the traffic going. That's less emails I'm going to deal with on Sunday and Monday, so I do appreciate that. Um, but how do we create these moments, these experiences? The fireworks at Disney, the customer service that flipped the script, took, that took a negative experience, flipped it into something positive, to where we're making memories that will, will, we can quantify some of those things. There are metrics, there are measurables that when we do well, we raise more money, people buy more merch, people buy more, that, and that's all great but we're in this for the long haul. I'm, I'm looking for the kid that is seven years old out of Missouri that maybe is gonna be a gymnast here one day, or maybe will be just a general student here one day, and our applications go up because we had game day here twice in three weeks, and we had a three hour commercial for the University of Georgia, and now they think of Athens as a place they wanna go to. We'll never be able to truly measure those things, but we gotta believe that those, those things exist and they will lead to bigger things. And the last thing, I just wanna ch challenge everyone here. Um, you all have a job to do, you lead businesses, you, and of course there are metrics that you have to live by. There are goals and, and you, you know, you've got to generate enough revenue to keep the lights on, right? And that's important, but I, I would ask each of you to take time to stop and think, are there things in what you do on a daily basis or longer than that, that can just improve the experience for everyone, for you, for your employees, for your staff, for your customers, everyone to think long-term, to think about, to not get so caught up into details of what that costs directly, but what that can lead to indirectly. So for me, um, and it's something that we're gonna hang our hat on here, is the indirect return on investment. So, thank you. I don't know if I went too long or too short. No. So obviously um, NIL went into effect July 1 of this year and it was a, it's new uncharted waters for us. For us it all starts with education. So we partnered with a group called Altius and education is the foundation of all of it. Letting them understand the implications of everything they do, right? So you sign this deal, there's tax implications. And you would be impressed, I was impressed with 18, 19 year old, 20, 20 year old, the questions they're asking, the way they're thinking. because. Beyond that, beyond tax implications, you want them to understand what is a good deal, what is a bad deal. And we can't technically advise them, but we can help provide them information. The good news is as more deals come out, everyone has a better understanding. So if 
um, a student athlete from another university signs a deal with company A for two tweets a month, a Facebook post, and a YouTube video, and they get X, and they're this level company. And that same company offers you a similar deal. More information's out there, and we can say, hey, look, they offered them this. You need to know what a fair deal is. You also need to understand about you know, perpetuity and signing away your rights in perpetuity. And what is it, a one-year deal, two-year deal? Um, and sometimes they'll try to lock a kid in, you know, buy low, sell high, right? So, um, so it starts with education. The next piece of it is we're partnering with a group um, who will help them grow their social media brand, teaching them how to manage the brand. Now, the greatest indir indirect consequence of, of this NIL is our student athletes have cleaned up their social media so much. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we could preach to them all the time about keep your social media clean, keep it clean. We don't have to preach it anymore because they know that if they want to be an influencer, they've got to be clean and they've got to also, part of the education is, you know, hey, don't, don't be ad, 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 ad. People are going to unfollow you. So you've got to produce original content, be unique, be genuine. Then you can throw in an ad every now and then. So we have another group that's working with them on how to grow their brand. One of the things we've done with that group is we've allowed, we have a way to upload every photo. So if, let's say Brandon Boykin's back playing, we tag every photo he's in, and then it goes into this database that he has access to through his social media, and he can log into. If he wanted to put up a post and say, throwback Thursday, he's got access to a photo from a year ago and post it. And helping them post that original content will help them grow their brand so that when they do the advertisement, they've, they've already grown the brand, and it's not just ad, ad, ad again. So it's education about what the world looks like, but it's also helping them grow in that space. And look, within the rules, we're going to do everything we can to support our student athletes. Um, we'll never break a rule to get a kid. We'll never break a rule when we have a kid. But with the, we're, with the rule, within the rules, we're going to do everything we can. Now, the thing that we need right now is federal legislation. We've got different states with different rules, different laws. We need federal legislation that preempts all of this so we can all be playing um, from the same rule book. That's the issue we're facing right now with NIL. Well, first of all, I, I think I need Nakobe mentoring me, not me mentoring. <laughs> I am actually his mentor. He's my mentee and, and is only entitled because the young man is phenomenal in every phase of life. He is just a phenomenal young man. Now, when you talk about programming them and getting them ready for life after college, it's difficult. Uh, Brandon can be the first one to tell you when you're 18, 19, or 20, we can, we can preach it to you all day, but you don't want to hear about all these things in financial literacy so it, it does, it is, it is difficult. But that's why the George Way program is so important. It's a way we can connect with postgraduates and help them out. And, and it's about making those connections now. Brandon and I got to know each other in 2008 when I was football operations and he was a freshman. And we've developed a relationship. And through that relationship, we've stayed in touch. And knowing the kind of person he is, when we had a spot come open, he was the first person I thought of that, man, he'd be great to join our team. It's developing those relationships and helping to grow, the, grow those people along the way. I'll tell you another story. Young man that I was a mentor of, Cornelius Washington. Okay, so, you know, I was his mentor. I, I tried to get him to listen to a lot of things when he was a student, and he did, but, you know, how much, right? So he goes on and plays in the league for five or six years, and uh, about a couple years ago he made the decision it was time to retire, and he had an opportunity to interview for a, a job at the University of Washington. So then he calls me. And we spent the next month going over everything, right? And he listened intently, and he was firing me emails and questions and calls. It was nonstop. I got his full undivided attention at that point. So we went over, hey, let's clean up your resume. Let's clean up your reference letter. 
let's, uh, let's, let's talk through the interview process, questions to ask, questions not to ask, preparing him, well, just a month of just going back and forth, getting him ready. But it was because of the relationship that we had that he could call me and we could go through that process. And he wound up getting the job and he's doing great now at the University of Washington. So it's making those connections. We have those people, and Jonas Shinnings and Bryant Gant and other people like that, that they know they can come back to and we'll help them. So them knowing that we're always here for them is the key to that. Because, again, we're going to try to really, you know, really pound it in their heads and get them to understand these things. But sometimes it's going to take that postgraduate year, then you can help them out. But knowing that we're still going to be here for them, and that's why we want to keep expanding that Georgia Way program to where we can be there for them when they're, when they're playing their year up. I've not thought about the LinkedIn premium. That's a good idea. I'd like to connect you with um, with Lee Futch, who heads up our George Wade program, and we could we could see what's possible there. I cannot comment on any recruit or any potential student athlete. <laughs> I can say this, though, that I was, um, it's a funny story. My first, um, one of my first experiences was working the Manning camp when I was a uh, student uh, in high school back in the mid 90s. You know, growing up in Louisiana, so I've uh, I followed that family. But yeah, no, I can't comment on any potential student athlete. I love that question. Um, yeah, I'll tell you right now, we're, we we've um, we signed an agreement a couple years ago that that's fully getting executed now, but it carries us through 2023. Um, you know, I, I got to focus on what's in front of me right now. That's not that's that we're locked in through 23. I think when we get closer to that time, then we'll have to evaluate all the factors. I completely understand Coach Smart's point of view, um, and we'll see what the future holds in terms of how conference, uh, you know, the alignment goes. But um, it's too early to, to have a true opinion on that right now. And we'll just got to keep evaluating the nature of that game and, and ultimately what's best for the University of Georgia. I think we could rotate it between Athens and Jacksonville, by the way. I think that's a great, <laughs> great rotation. <laughs> Yeah, well, you know, it's only twice on campus, so that was a new experience for two times of, you know, being in Charlotte was a little different. But, And then we had an SEC Nation as well and a CBS broadcast. So you had ESPN, Game Day, SEC Nation, and CBS. And they're really three individual, you know, unique identities. So it's, it's, it's a little challenge trying to host them all and meet their needs. But we have so many great stories to tell, if you think about it, so many great student athletes that I think we could – we could have him here every week, and we'd have more great stories to tell. I'm telling you, N'Kobe Dean is the tip of the iceberg. But I'm telling you, they could spend three hours on game day talking about that young man and his experience and his future. 
and they wouldn't run out of air time. Um, it, it's there's so many great stories. But again, it's a three hour commercial for the University of Georgia and and uh, I'm a little nervous because I've got a niece who has applied uh, for admission. She's a senior in high school, she's applied, so I'm scared about these admission standards going up. I'm trying to, hopefully she gets in, so. So, uh, but you know that with that, that kind of exposure leads to greater interest in the university. So it, it's such a great, great thing to have those, those weekends like that. You know, uh, that's just part of it, but I, th I can tell you right now, I think that all 21 of our teams have a student athlete with an IL deal right now. Um, early on in July, you saw a big influx of football because football season's around the corner. Now you're starting to see the other deals pop up. So you'll start to see that grow. And, and look, it could be small deals, it could be any kind of deal, but just give them that freedom. And that's where part of that is on them to grow their brand or to be successful because we, we, cannot, we cannot play a role in it. We can't ask a company, we can't get involved. Um, so it, the pressure's not on us, it's the pressure's on them. And, and, and a lot of times when you see student athletes from smaller sports get deals, it's because they were already a social media influencer separate from their athletic success. They, for whatever reason, you know, this new generation of wanting, they all wanna be influencers and, and have followers. So that's what drives a lot of it. But you've seen a, a bunch of other deals and again, that's why we want to, the education and the services we provide are for all 21 sports. Um, and I think there'll be some niche markets out there for different sports as they, have, they all have different fan bases. And I think you'll see it continue to grow um, throughout. Um, so we'll see, but, but I don't feel, you know, it's funny, I, I had Clint Bowling, um, former officer lineman, University of Georgia played the Bengals. And I asked him, I said, because the one question everybody always asks me is, how do you think a team feels when player A gets a deal, the quarterback runner makes a deal, and the linemen don't get a deal. He goes, look, I was in the league, played with Andy Dalton. Andy Dalton got a lot more deals than I got. As long as he take me out to dinner once in a while, I was fine with it. So, <laughs> and I think you'll see, you see that a lot. You'll see the quarterbacks, you know, I think JT, one of his deals he shared with his teammates. So I think you'll see a lot of the veterans do smart moves like that and, and take care of their teammates. So um, look, it's uncharted water and it's changing every day, but I think for what we expected, it's, it's gone relatively smooth. And that's a testament to really our compliance and legal staff at the University of Georgia. I'm sorry, I apologize. For <laughs> yeah, so one of the things we've challenged our staff, and this is really uh, uh, stolen a little bit from Coach Smart, is, you know, he says keep chopping wood, you know, all that. Our, our focus is getting 1% better every day. And I th I've got 300 full-time employees, over 300 part-time employees, 540 student athletes. If every one of us are focused on getting 1% better every day, we stack up enough of those days over time, we're gonna get a lot of m massive things accomplished. Sometimes we think, and, and when you're a new AD, you just wanna, you wanna change the world day one. And sometimes you gotta take a step back and say, I'm in this for long haul. I'm not in this for a short period of time. So it's not all about getting everything you want done in year one or month one or so it's about getting 1% better. And that's everything from just how we work to how we treat people, you name it. So the challenge to everyone is don't be stagnant in anything we do, whether it's event operations or promotions or marketing, et cetera. Let's keep finding ways to get 1% better every day. I figured my, my crew would have something for me here. In that. In terms of, oh, projects, okay. So for the McGill Society, we're excited that uh, our next massive project for McGill is going to, that's gonna impact our McGill Society is, you know, we talked about moving the press. We're gonna build a new press box on the southwest corner of the stadium. And we're talking about the writing press. We're not talking about TV or radio, things like that, but the writing press 
moving them to the northwest corner, building them a new area, and taking the old press box, which if any of you have ever been in there, it is the best seat in Sanford Stadium, and converting that into loge-type situation where you've got nice, comfortable chairs, maybe a TV in front of you, and then a common area where you come back and eat behind you. And we still have to work through exactly what the layout of that's going to be. But one of the things we need at Sanford is more premium spaces. We have got, we've got to create more premium opportunities because our McGill donors have stepped up and supported our program so well. We've built, in the last 10 years, all the construction projects we've built over, I don't, I don't know if I'm going to mess up the number, but I know, it's, I know it's over $200 million without taking on a dollar of, of long-term debt. Think about that. We've been built and built and built and without taking on new debt. So as we move out of the pandemic, we're able to stay aggressive. As we talk about the tennis indoor facility that we're starting on, expanding and renovating Foley Field, expanding and renovating our Turner softball complex and the work we're going to do at Sanford, we can do these things because we haven't taken on long-term debt and we're planning to do these things with the money we have on hand and the money we're raising right now. So it's an exciting time and not to bad mouth any of our peers, but I talked to all of our peers and no one that I've talked to is anywhere near or close to the situation we're in in terms of financial stability moving out of the pandemic. So this is an exciting time. We're not a time where we're pumping the brakes, but a time we're pressing the gas pedal and we're gonna try to get ahead as people maybe lap a few people in terms of this arms race of facilities and how we support our student athletes. That's it, yeah. Appreciate y'all, yeah. Josh, it's our custom to present a nice red and black sculpture for you. So thank you for being with us today. Thank you for your leadership for athletics program. Go dogs. If we have not paid for your parking yet, we'd love to do so. We can validate that uh, outside. Hope everybody has a great uh, rest of the week. Look forward to hopefully seeing some of you in Jacksonville as the uh, dogs beat the Gators next week. And uh, remember, next month we'll be back. Chris Romack will be speaking, so have a great rest of the week. Thank you.